I looked at him lost in astonishment. There he was before me and motley as though he had been absconded from a troop of mimes, enthusiastic, fabulous. His very existence was improbable, inexplicable, and altogether bewildering. He was an insoluble problem. It was inconceivable how he had existed, how he had succeeded in getting so far, how he had managed to remain why he did not instantly disappear. I went a little farther, he said, then still a little farther, till I had gone so far that I don't know how I ever got back. Never mind, plenty time, I can manage. You take Kurtz away quick, quick, I tell you. The glamour of youth enveloped his parti-colored rags, his destitution, his loneliness, the essential desolation of his futile wanderings. For months, for years, his life hadn't been worth a day's purchase, and there he was gallantly, thoughtlessly alive, to all appearance indestructible indestructible solely by the virtue of a few years and of his unreflecting audacity. I was seduced into something like admiration, like envy. Glamour urged him on. Glamour kept him unscathed. He surely wanted nothing from the wilderness but space to breathe in to push on through. His need was to exist and to move onwards at the greatest possible risk and with a maximum of privation. If the absolutely pure, uncalculating, unpractical spirit of adventure had ever ruled a human being, it ruled this bepatched youth. I almost envied him the possession of this modest and clear flame. It seemed to have consumed all thought of self so completely that, even while he was talking to you, you forgot that it was he, the man before your eyes, who had gone through these things. I did not envy him his devotion to Kurtz, though. He had not meditated over it. It came to him, and he accepted it with a sort of eager fatalism. I must say that to me it appeared about the most dangerous thing in every way he had ever come upon so far. They had come together unavoidably, like two ships becalmed near each other and lay rubbing sides at last. I suppose Kurtz wanted an audience, because on a certain occasion, when encamped in the forest, they had talked all night, or more probably Kurtz had talked. We talked of everything, he said, quite transported at the recollection. I forgot there was such a thing as sleep. The night did not seem to last an hour. Everything, everything of love too. Ah, I talked of you of love, I said, much amused. It isn't what you think. It was in general he made me see things. How's everybody doing out there tonight? He threw up his arms. We were on deck at the time, and the head man of my woodcutters, lounging nearby, turned upon him as his heavy and glittering eyes. I looked around, and I don't know why, but I assure you that never, never before did this land, this river, this jungle, this very arch of this blazing sky, appear to me so hopeless and so dark, so impenetrable to human thought, 
so pitiless to human weakness. And ever since you have been with him, of course, I said. On the contrary, it appears their intercourse had been very much broken by various causes. He had, as he informed me proudly, managed to nurse Kurtz through two illnesses. He alluded to it as you would, as you would to some risky feat. But as a rule, Kurtz wandered alone, far into the depths of the forest. Very often coming to the station, I had to wait days and days before he would turn up. Ah, uh, it was worth waiting for, sometimes. What was he doing? Exploring or what? I asked. Oh yes, yes of course, he had discovered lots of villages. A lake too. He did not know exactly in what direction. It was dangerous to inquire too much. Mostly his expeditions have been for ivory. Oracles, oracles and beyond. But he had no goods to trade with by that time. There's a good lot of cartridges left even yet. To speak plainly, he raided the country, I said. He nodded. Not alone, surely. He muttered something about the villages around that lake. Kurtz got the tribe to follow him, did he? I suggested. He fidgeted a little. They adored him, he said. The tone of these words was so extraordinary that I looked at him searchingly. It was curious to see his mingled eagerness and reluctance to speak of Kurtz. The man filled his life, occupied his thoughts, swayed his emotions. What can you expect, he burst out. He came to them with thunder and lightning, you know, and they had never seen anything like it and very terrible. He could be very terrible. You can't judge Mr. Kurtz as you would an ordinary man. No, no, no. Now, just to give you an idea, I don't mind telling you. He wanted to shoot me too one day, but I don't judge him. Shoot you, I cried? For what? Well, I had a small lot of ivory the chief of that village near my house gave me. You see, I used to shoot game for them. Well, he wanted it and wouldn't hear a reason. He declared he would shoot me unless I gave him the ivory and then declared out of the country. Because he could do so and had a fancy for it. And there was nothing on earth to prevent him killing whom he jolly well pleased. And it was true, too. I gave him the ivory. What did I care? But I didn't clear out. No, I couldn't leave him. I had to be careful, of course, till we got friendly again for a time. He had his second illness then. Afterwards, I had to keep out of the way. But I didn't mind. He was living, for the most part, in those villages on the lake. When he came down to the river, sometimes he would take to me. And sometimes it was better for me to be careful. This man suffered too much. He hated all this and somehow he couldn't get away. When I had a chance, I begged him to try and leave while there was time. I offered to go back with him. And he would say yes. And then he would remain. Go off on another ivory hunt. Disappear for weeks. Forget himself amongst these people. Forget himself, you know. Why? He's mad, I said. He protested indignantly. Mr. Kurtz couldn't be mad. If I had heard him talk only two days ago, I wouldn't dare hint at such a thing. I had taken up my binoculars while we talked. 
and was looking at the shore, sweeping the lemon of the forest at each side at the back of the house. The consciousness of there being people in that bush, so silent, so quiet, as silent and quiet as the ruined house on the hill, made me uneasy. Angela, Angela Critters, welcome to the House of Thrones. Linda Parker, Linda Parker, welcome. Good evening, Moses. How are you, my friend? Ch 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 jelly duck. Ch ch jelly duck. Cheryl Foster. Cheryl Foster, ladies and gentlemen. The one and only Koshav Shavit. Koshav Shavit. Koshav Shavit. Welcome to the House of Thrillers, ladies and gentlemen, the NDT show. CJ Lutero, welcome. CJ Lutero. of Thrillers Devil Hunter Entertainment. 4Ks We Love Rain. 4Ks We Love Rain. The Revealing Unknown. Art is fun with Keely. Welcome to the House of Thrillers. Consciousness of there being people in that bush, so silent, so quiet, as silent and quiet as the ruined house on the hill, made me uneasy. There was no sign on the face of nature of this amazing tale that was not so much told as suggested to me in desolate exclamations, completed by shrugs and interrupted phases, and hence ending in deep sighs. The woods were unmoved, like a mask, heavy, like the closed door of a prison. They looked with the air of hidden knowledge, of patient expectation, of unapproachable silence. The Russian was explaining to me that it was only lately that Mr. Kurtz had come down to the river, bringing along with him all the fighting men of that lake tribe. He had been absent, <clears throat> sweet but not nice. You're too cute. Ooh, we He had been absent for several months, getting himself adored, I suppose. And had come down unexpectedly with the intention to all appearance of making a raid either across the river or downstream. Evidently the appetite for more ivory had gotten the better of the, what shall we say, less material aspirations. However, he had got much worse suddenly. I heard he was lying helpless. And so I came up, took my chance, said the Russian. Oh, he is bad, very bad. I directed my glass to the house. There were no signs of life. But there were the ruined roof, the long mud walls peeping above the grass with three little square window holes, no two of the same size. All this brought within reach of my hand, as it were. And then I made a brusque movement. 
and one of the remaining posts of that vanished fence leaped up in the field of my glass. You remember I told you I had been struck at the distance by certain attempts at ornamentation, rather remarkable in the ruinous aspect of the place. Oracles, oracles and beyond. of thrillers welcome to the house i appreciate you guys coming in tonight we're reading the classic heart of darkness part three The admirer of Mr. Curse was a bit crestfallen. In a hurried, indistinct voice, he began to assure me he had not dared to take these things, these, say these symbols down. He was not afraid of the natives. They would not stir till Mr. Kurtz gave the word. His ascendancy was extraordinary. The camps of these people surrounded the place and the chiefs came every day to see him. They would crawl. I don't want to know anything of the ceremonies you when approaching Mr. Kurtz, I shouted. Curious. This feeling that came over me, that such details would be more intolerable than those heads drying on the stakes under Mr. Kurtz's windows. After all, that was only a savage sight, while well, I seemed at one bound to have been transported into some lightless region of subtle horrors, where pure, uncomplicated savagery was a positive relief being something that had a right to exist, obviously, in the sunshine. The young man looked at me with surprise. I suppose it did not occur to him that Mr. Kurtz was no idol of mine. He forgot I hadn't heard of these splendid monologues on, what was it, on love, justice, conduct of life or what not. If it had come to crawling before Mr. Kurtz, he crawled as much as the veriest savage of them all. I had no idea of the conditions, he said. These heads were the heads of rebels. I shocked him excessively by laughing. Rebels? What would be the next definition I was to hear? There had been enemies, criminals, workers, and these were rebels. Scorpion King, Scorpion King, Scorpion King, Scorpion. Those rebellious heads look very subdued to me on their stick. You don't know how such a life tries a man like Kurtz. Well, I, I'm a simple man. I have no great thoughts. I want nothing from anybody. How can you compare me to... I don't understand, he groaned. I've been doing my best to keep him alive and that's enough. I had no hand in all this. I have no abilities. There hasn't been a drop of medicine or a mouthful of invalid food for months here. He was shamefully abandoned. A man like this? With such ideas? Shamefully. Shamefully. Uh, uh, I haven't slept for the last ten nights. 
His voice was lost in itself in the calm of the evening. The long shadows of the forest that slipped downhill while we talked had gone far beyond the ruined hovel, beyond the symbolic row of stakes. All this was in the gloom, while we down there were yet in the sunshine, and the stretch of the river abreast of the clearing glittered in a still and dazzling splendor with a murky and overshadowed bend above and below. Not a living soul was seen on the shore. The bushes did not rustle. Sweet but not nice. Hey there, Scorpion, grab some hot chocolate and get comfy. Suddenly round the corner of the house a group of men appeared, as though they had come up from the ground. They waited waist deep in the grass in a compact body bearing an imp improvised stretcher. <laughs> Let's try that again. They waited waist deep in the grass in a compact body bearing an improvised stretcher in their midst. Yes, I am human. I'm Scully, the author that reads to you. Now, if he does not say the right thing to them, we are all done for. The Russian was at my elbow. The knot of men with the stretcher had stopped to halfway to the steamer as if petrified. I saw the man on the stretcher sit up, lank, and with an uplifted arm above the shoulders of the bearers. Let us hope that the man who can talk so well of love in general will find some particular reason to spare us this time, I said. I resented bitterly the absurd danger of our situation, as if to be at the mercy of that atrocious phantom had been a dishonoring necessity. I could not hear a sound. But through my glasses I saw the thin arm extended commandingly, the lower jaw moving, the eyes of that apparition shining darkly far in its bony head that nodded with grotesque jerks. Kurtz, Kurtz, that means shut in German, don't it? Well, the name was as true as everything else in his life and death. He looked at least seven feet long. His covering had fallen off and his body emerged from it pitiful and appalling as from a winding sheet. I could see the cage of his ribs all astir, the bones of his arms waving. It was as though an animated image of death carved out, carved out of an old ivory had been shaking its hand with menaces as a motionless crowd of men made of dark and glittering. I saw him open his mouth wide. It gave him a weirdly voracious aspect, as though he had wanted to swallow all the air, all the earth, all the men before him. A deep voice reached me faintly. He must have been shouting. He fell back suddenly. A stretcher shook as the bear staggered forward again, and almost at the same time I noticed that the crowd of savages was vanishing without any, any perceptible movement of retreat. As if the force that had ejected these beings so suddenly had drawn them in again as the breath is drawn in a long aspiration.
One second, ladies and gentlemen. Goodness, you guys, I'm so sorry I had to reset my router. How's everybody doing out there? Poetically yours by Javi Santa Maria. Welcome to the house, buddy. Tonight, we are reading the classic Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad. <clears throat> Sweet but not nice. No, I don't have a Spotify channel. I do have a podcast on the back burner that I'm working on. Sk -sk Scorpion King. Sweet but not nice. Right on, buddy, with extra marshmallows. Welcome to the House of Thrillers. I'm Scully, the author that reads to you. Linda Barker. I'm so glad you made it tonight. Javier Santa Maria. Poetically yours by Javier Santa Maria. If you're enjoying the video tonight, don't forget to hit the like and Leave a comment down below. Moses, welcome to the house, buddy. Angela, Angela, Angela Critters. Welcome to the house, Angela. I'm mostly lurking and listening. Sweet but not nice. Here at the House of Thrillers, we make videos about publishing. 
creative writing dark human shapes could be made out in the distance flitting indistinctly against the gloomy border of the forest and near the river two bronze figures leaning on tall spears stood in the sunlight under fantastic headdresses headdresses of spotted skins warlike and still in statuesque repose and from the right to left along the lighted shore moved a wild and gorgeous apparition of a woman she walked with measured steps draped and striped in fringed cloths treading the earth proudly with a slight jingling flash of barbarous ornaments. Is that barbarous or barbarous? Barbarous, I think. Sherry McMillan, welcome to the House of Thrillers. You're highly welcome, my friend. She carried her head high. Her hair was done in the shape of a helmet. She had brass leggings to the knee, brass wire gauntlets. <clears throat> she had brass leggings to the knee, brass wire gauntlets to the elbow, a crimson spot on her tawny cheek. Innumerable necklaces of glass beads on her neck. Bizarre things. Charms. Gifts of witch men that hung about her, glittered and trembled at every step. She must have had the value of several elephant tusks upon her. She was savage and superb, wild-eyed and magnificent. There was something ominous and stately in her deliberate progress. And in the hush that had fallen suddenly upon the whole sorrowful land, the immense wilderness, the colossal body of the fecund and mysterious life seemed to look at her, pensive as though it had been looking at the image of its own tenebrous and passionate soul. She came abreast of the steamer, stood still and faced us. Her long shadow fell to the water's edge. Her face had a tragic and fierce aspect of wild sorrow and of dumb pain mingled with the fear of some struggling half-shaped resolve. She stood looking at us with a stir and like the wilderness itself with an air of brooding over an inscrutable purpose. A whole minute passed, and then she made a step forward. There was a low jingle, a glint of yellow metal, a sway of fringe draperies, and she stopped as if her heart had failed her. The pilgrims murmured at my back. She looked at us all as if her life had depended upon the unswerving steadiness of her glance. Suddenly she opened her bared arms and threw them up rigid above her head as though in an, as though in an uncontrollable desire to touch the sky. And at the same time the swift shadows darted out on the earth, swept around on the river 
gathering the steamer in a shadowy, shadowy embrace. Spooky. Spooky. She turned away slowly, walked on, following the bank, and passed into the bushes to the left. Once only her eyes gleamed back at us in the dusk of the thickets before she disappeared. If she had offered to come aboard, I really think I would have tried to shoot her said the man of patches nervously. I had been risking my life every day for the last fortnight to keep her out of the house. She got in one day and kicked up a row about those miserable rags I picked up in the storeroom to mend my clothes with. I wasn't decent. At least it must have been for that, for she talked like a fury to Kurtz for an hour, pointing at me now and then. I don't understand the dialect of this tribe. Luckily for me, I fancy Kurtz felt too ill that day to care, or there would have been mischief. I don't understand. <clears throat> it's not much for me. Ah, well, it's all over now. At this moment, I heard Kurtz's deep voice behind the curtain. Save me. Save the ivory. You mean... Don't tell me, save me. Why, I've had to save you. You're interrupting my plans now. Sick, sick. Not so sick as you would like to believe. Never mind. I'll carry my ideas out yet. I will return. I'll show you what you can be done. You with your little peddling notions. You're interfering me. I return. I... The manager came out. He did me the honor to take me under the arm and lead me aside. He is very low. Very low, he said. He considered it necessary to sigh but neglected to be so consistently sorrowful. We have done all we could for him, haven't we? But there is no disguising the fact Mr. Kurtz has done more harm than good to the company. He did not see the time was not right for vigorous action. Cautiously, cautiously, that's my principle. We must be cautious yet. The district is closed to us for a time, deplorable. Upon the whole, the trade will suffer. I don't deny there is a remarkable quantity of ivory, mostly fossil. We must save it at all events, but look how precarious the position is and why. Because the method is unsound. Do you? said I, looking at the shore. Called unsound method? Without doubt, he exclaimed hotly. Don't you? No method at all, I murmured after a while. Exactly, he exulted. I anticipated this. Shows a complete one of judgment. It is my duty to point it out in the proper quarter. Ah, uh, that fellow, what's his name? The brickmaker will make a readable report for you. He, he appeared confounded for a moment. It seemed to me I had never breathed an atmosphere so vile, and I turned mentally to Kurtz for relief, positively for relief. Nevertheless, I think Mr. Kurtz is a remarkable man. I had turned to the wilderness, really, not to Mr. Kurtz, who, I'm ready to admit, was as good as buried. 
and for a moment it seemed to me as if I also were buried in a vast grave full of unspeakable secrets. I felt an intolerable weight oppressing my breast, the smell of the damp earth, the unseen presence of victorious corruption, the darkness of an impenetrable night. yours by Javier Santa Maria. Everybody kick back, relaxed, taking it easy. The house of thrillers. Cus, 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 cus. Sammy Superstar. something about Brother Seaman couldn't conceal knowledge of matters that would affect Mr. Kurtz's reputation. I waited. For him, evidently, Mr. Kurtz was not in his grave. I suspect that for him, Mr. Kurtz was one of the immortals. Mr. Curtis's reputation. All right, I said. Mr. Curtis's reputation is safe with me. I did not know how I truly spoke. He informed me, lowering his voice, that it was Kurtz who had ordered the attack to be made on the steamer. He hated sometimes the idea of being taken away, and then again, but I don't understand these matters. I am a simple man. He thought it would scare you away, that you would give it up thinking him dead. I could not stop him. Oh, I had an awful time of it this last month. Very well, I said. He's all right now. Yes. And thank you. I promised a complete discretion with great gravity. I have a canoe and three black fellows waiting not very far. I'm off. Could you give me a few Martini Henry cartridges? I could and did with proper secrecy. He helped himself with a wink at me to a handful of my tobacco. Between sailors, you know, good English tobacco. door of the pilot house he turned round. I say, haven't you a pair of shoes you could spare? He raised one leg. Look. The soles were tied with knotted strings sandal wise under his bare feet. I rooted out an old pair, at which he looked at with admiration before tucking it under his left arm.
When I woke up shortly after midnight, his warning came to my mind with its hint of danger that seemed in the star darkness, real enough to make me get up for the purpose of having a look round. On the hill, a big fire burned, illuminating fitfully a crooked corner of the station house. One of the agents with a picket of a few of our blacks on aim for the purpose was keeping guard over the ivory. But deep within the forest, red gleams that wavered that seemed to sink and rise from the ground amongst confused columnar shapes of intense blackness showed the exact position of the camp where Mr. Kurtz's adorers were keeping their uneasy vigil. The monotonous beating of a big drum filled the air with muffled shocks and a lingering vibration. A steady droning sound of many men chanting, chanting. <laughs> one more time. A steady droning sound of many men chanting each to himself some weird incantation came out from the black flat wall of the woods as the humming of bees comes out of a hive and had a strange narcotic effect upon my half awake senses. I believe I dozed off leaning over the rail till an abrupt burst of yells, an overwhelming outbreak of a pent up and mysterious frenzy woke me up in a bewildered wonder. It was cut short all at once, and the low droning went on with an effect of audible and soothing silence. I glanced casually into the little cabin. A light was burning within, but Mr. Kurtz was not there. I think I would have raised an outcry if I had believed my eyes. But I didn't believe them at first. The thing seemed so impossible. The fact is, I was completely unnerved by a sheer blank fright. Pure abstract terror, unconnected with any distinct shape of physical danger. What made this emotion so overpowering was, how shall I define it, the moral shock I received. As if something altogether monstrous intolerable thought and odious to the soul had been thrust upon me unexpectedly. This lasted, of course, the merest fraction of a second, and then the, and then the usual sense of commonplace, deadly danger, the possibility of a sudden onslaught and massacre, or something of the kind, which I saw impending was positively welcome and composing. It pacified me, in fact, so much that I did not raise an alarm. Da 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 gee, welcome buddy. So la vie, so la vie, so la vie. Welcome to the house of thrillers. This is The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, Part 3. Live abridged reading of The Heart of Darkness.
If you guys are enjoying the video, don't forget to hit the like. So lovely, it says dark moon of the year is arriving. As soon as I got on the bank, I saw a trail, a broad trail through the grass. I remember the exultation with which I said to myself, he can't walk. He's crawling on all fours. I've got him. The grass was wet with dew. I strode rapidly with I strode rapidly with clenched fists. I fancy I had some vague notion of falling upon him and giving him a drubbing. I don't know. I had some imbecile thoughts. The knitting old woman with the cow cat obtruded herself upon my memory as a most improper person to be sitting at the other end of such an affair. I saw a row of pilgrims squirting lead in the air out of Winchester's hell to the hip. I thought I would never get back to the steamer. And imagine myself living alone and unarmed in the woods to an advanced age. Such silly things. You know. And I remember I confounded the beat of the drum with the beating of my heart. came upon him and if he had not heard me coming I would have fallen over him too but he got up in time he rose unsteady long pale indistinct like a vapor exhaled by the earth and swayed slightly misty and silent before me while at my back the fires loomed between the trees and the murmur of many voices issued from the forest. I had cut him off cleverly, but when actually confronting him, I seemed to come to my senses. I saw the danger in its right proportion. It was by no means over yet, Suppose he began to shout. Though he could hardly stand, there was still plenty of vigor in his voice. Go away! Hide yourself! He said in that profound tone. It was awful. I glanced back. We were within 30 yards from the nearest fire. A black figure stood up, strode on long black legs, waving long black arms across the glow. It had horns, antelope horns, I think. Some sorcerer, some witch man, no doubt, it looked fiend like enough. Do you know what you're doing? I whispered. Perfectly, he answered, raising his voice for that single word. It sounded meek, far off, and yet loud, 
like a hell through a speaking trumpet. a row we are lost I thought to myself I had to beat that shadow this wandering and tormented thing you will be lost I said utterly lost One gets sometimes such a flash of, in, flash of inspiration, you know. I did say the right thing, though. Indeed, he could not have been more irretrievably lost than he was at this very moment when the foundations of our intimacy were being laid to endure, to endure, even to the end, even beyond. Or oracles and beyond I had immense plans he muttered it irresolutely yes said I but if you try to shout I'll smash your head with there was not a stick or a stone near I will throttle you for good I corrected myself I was on the threshold of great things, he pleaded in a voice of longing with a wistfulness of tone that made my blood run cold. Now for the stupid scoundrel. Your success in Europe is assured in any case, I affirmed steadily. I did not want to have the throttling of him, you understand, and indeed it would have been very little use for any practical purpose. I tried to break the spell. The heavy mute of the wilderness. seemed to draw him to its pitiless breast by the awaking of forgotten and brutal instincts. By the memory of gratified and monstrous passions. This alone, I was convinced, had driven him out to the edge of the forest, to the bush, towards the gleam of fires, the throb of drums, a drone of weird incantations. This lone had beguiled his unlawful soul beyond the bounds of permitted aspirations. And, don't you see, the terror of the position was not being knocked on the head, though I had a very lively sense of that danger too. But in this, though I had to deal with a being to whom I could not appeal in the name of anything high or low. I had nothing either above or below him, and I knew it. He had kicked himself loose of the earth. day we left at noon the crowd of whose presence behind the curtain of trees I have been acutely conscious all the time flew out of the woods again filled the clearing covering the slope with a mass of naked breathing quivering bronze bodies I steamed up a bit then swung downstream 
and 2,000 eyes followed the evolutions of the splashy, dumpy, fierce river demon beating the water with its terrible tail and breathing black smoke into the air. In front of the first rank, along the river, three men, plastered with bright red earth from head to foot, strutted to and fro restlessly. When we came abreast again, they faced the river, stamped their feet, nodded their horn heads, swayed their scarlet bodies. They shook towards the fierce river demon a bunch of black feathers, a mangy skin with a pendant tail, something that looked like a dry gourd. They shouted periodically together strings of amazing words that resembled no sounds of human language and the deep murmurs of the crowd interrupted suddenly with like the responses of some satanic litany. We had carried Kurt into the pilot house. There was more air there. Lying on the couch, he stared through the open shutter. There was an eddy in the mass of human bodies, and the woman with helmeted head and tawny cheeks rushed out onto the very brink of the stream. She put out her hands, shouted something, and all that wild mob took up the shout in a roaring chorus of articulated, rapid, breathless utterance. Do you understand this? I asked. He kept on looking out past me with fiery, longing eyes with a mingled expression of wistfulness and hate. He made no answer, but I saw a smile. The brown current ran swiftly out of the heart of darkness, bearing us down towards the sea with twice the speed of our upward progress. And Curtis' life was running swiftly too, ebbing, ebbing out of his heart into the sea of inexorable time. The manager was very placid. He had no vital anxieties now. He took us both in with a comp comprehensive and satisfied glance. The pilgrims looked upon me with disfavor. I was, so to speak, numbered with the dead. It is strange how I accepted this unforeseen partnership. This choice of nightmares forced upon me in the tenebrous land invaded by these mean and greedy phantoms. Kurtz discoursed a voice, a voice. It rang deep to the very last. It survived its strength to hide in the magnificent folds of eloquence the bar and darkness of his heart. Oh, he struggled, he struggled. The waste of his weary brain were haunted by shadowy images now. Images of wealth and fame revolving obsequiously around his unextinguishable gift of noble and lofty expression. My intended, my station, my career, my ideas. These were the subjects for the occasional utterances of elevated sentiments. The shade of the original Kurtz frequented the bedside of the hollow sham whose fate it was to be buried, buried presently in the mold of primeval earth. But 
both the diabolic love and the unearthly hate of the mysteries that had penetrated thought for the possession of that soul satiated with primitive emotions, avid of lying fame, of sham distinction, of all the appearances of success and power. The long reaches that were like one in the same reach. Monotonous bends that were exactly alike. Slip past the steamer with their multitude of secular trees. Looking patiently after this grimy fragment of another world. The forerunner of change. Of conquest. Of trade. Of massacres. Of blessings. His was an impenetrable darkness. I looked at him as you peered down at a man who was lying at the bottom of a precipice where the sun never shines. But I had not much time to give him because I was helping the engine driver to take to pieces the leaky cylinders to straighten a bent connecting rod and other such matters. I lived in an infernal mess of rust, filings, nuts, bolts, spanners, hammers, ratchet drills, things I abominate because I don't get on with them. One evening coming in with a candle I was startled to hear him say a little tremulously, I'm lying here in the dark waiting for death. The light was within a foot of his eyes. I forced myself to murmur, Oh, nonsense, and stood over him as if transfixed. Anything approaching the change that came over his features I had never seen before and hope to never see again. Oh, I wasn't touched. I was fascinated. It was as though a veil had been rent. I saw on that ivory face the expression of somber pride, of ruthless power, of craven terror, of an intense and hopeless despair. Did he live his life again in every detail of desire, temptation, and surrender during that supreme moment of complete knowledge? He cried in a whisper at some image, at some vision. He cried out twice. The cry was no more than a breath. The horror! The horror! I blew out the candle and left the cabin. The pilgrims were dining in the mess room and I took my place opposite the manager who lifted his eyes to me, a questioning glance, which I successfully ignored. He leaned back, serene, with that peculiar smile of assailing the unexpressed depths of his meanness. continuous shower of small flies steamed upon the lamp, upon the cloth, upon our hands and faces. Mr. Cuts, he's dead, Mr. Cuts, he's dead. All the pilgrims rushed out to sea. I remained and went on with my dinner. I believe I was considered brutally callous, 
However, I didn't eat much. The voice was gone. What else had been there? But I am of course aware the next day the pilgrims buried something in a muddy hole. And then they nearly buried me. Buried me. However, as you see, I did not go to join Kurtz there and then. I did not. I remained to dream the nightmare out to the end. And to show my loyalty to Kurtz once more. Destiny. My destiny. Droll thing life is. That mysterious arrangement of merciless logic for a futile purpose. The most you can hope for some knowledge of yourself that comes too late. A crop of unextinguishable regrets. I have wrestled with death. It is the most unexciting contest you can imagine. It takes place in an impalpable grayness, with nothing underfoot, with nothing around, without spectators, without clamor, without glory, without the great desire of victory, without the great fear of defeat, in a sickly atmosphere of tepid skepticism, without much belief in your own right, and still less than that of your adversary. If, if such is the form of ultimate wisdom, then life is a greater riddle than some of us think it to be. I found with humiliation that probably I would have nothing to say. That is the reason why I affirm that Kurtz was a remarkable man. He had something to say. He said it. Since I had peeped over the edge myself, I understand better the meaning of his stare that could not see the flame of the candle, but was wide to embrace the whole universe. Piercing enough to penetrate all the hearts that beat in the darkness. He had summed up, he had judged. The horror. He was a remarkable man. After all, this was the expression of some sort of belief. It had candor. It had conviction. It had a vibrating note of revolt in its whisper. It had the appalling face of a glimpsed truth. A strange commingling of desire and hate. guys doing all right out there scully oracles and beyond no they didn't bury me though there is a period of time which i remember mistily with a shuddering wonder like a passage through some inconceivable world that had no hope in it and no desire
Dagon Hills. D -d -d Dagon. Dagon Hills. Welcome, buddy. We're reading Heart of Darkness, Part 3. Abridged version. You guys don't know Dagon Hills, go over and check out his channel. He's got some really cool content. So, Lavi, how are you this evening? Oh, Linda them took her glasses off. She's kicking back and relaxing. Thrillers. Author that reads to you. You guys make sure to leave me a comment down below if something you'd like me to read, a classic. Put that on the list for you. Next on the list is The Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Well, you just keep lurking right where you are, Killy. Lurk away. Lurk, lurk, lurk. looking for some ideas for the holiday season go over there and check out artist fun with Keely the house of thrillers by Joseph Conrad was first published in 1899. Mr. Conrad was born in Russia and learned to speak, I believe it was Polish, and then his third language, language was English, which he wrote this novel in. It's one of the most studied novels of all time. say that perhaps Kurtz fell in love with a native in the jungle and I think that uh, what I'm about to read you guys is she's somewhat in mourning and she wants to talk to Marlo who is the protagonist Marlo who's uh, most say it was modeled after Conrad's life so maybe when Conrad went down to the jungle. Maybe he, he met and fell in love with somebody. A lot of speculation there. But she came forward all in black with a pale head floating towards me in the dusk. She was in mourning. It was more than a year since his death. More than a year since the news came. She seemed as though she would remember and mourn forever. She took both my hands in hers and murmured, I had heard you were coming. I noticed she was not very young. I mean, not girlish. She had a mature capacity for fidelity, for belief, for suffering. The room seemed to have grown darker as if all the sad light of the cloudy evening had taken refuge on her forehead. This fair hair, this pale visage, this pure brow, 
seemed surrounded by an ashy halo from which the dark eyes looked out at me. The glance was guileless, profound, confident, and trustful. She carried her sorrowful head as though she were proud of that sorrow, as though she would say, Ah, I alone know how to mourn for him as he deserves. But while we were still shaking hands, such a look of awful desolation came upon her face that I perceived she was one of those creatures that are not the playthings of time. For her he had died only yesterday. By Jove, the impression was so powerful that for me too he seemed to have died only yesterday. Nay, this very minute. I saw her and him in the same instant of time. His death and her sorrow. I saw her sorrow in the very moment of his death. Do you understand? I saw them together. She had said, with a deep catch of the breath, I have survived. While my restrained ears seemed to hear distinctly, mingled with her tone of despairing regret, the summing up whisper of his, of his eternal condemnation. I asked myself what I was doing there. With a sensation of panic in my heart as though I had blundered into a place of cruel and absurd mysteries not fit for a human being to behold. She motioned me to a chair. We sat down. I laid the packet gently on a little table, and she put her hand over it. You knew him well, she murmured, after a moment of mourning silence. Intimacy grows quickly out there, I said. I knew him as well as it is possible for one man to know another. And you admired him? It was impossible to know him and not admire him, was it? He was a remarkable man, I said unsteadily. Then before the appealing fixity of her gaze that seemed to watch for more words on my lips, I went on. It was impossible not to love him, she finished eagerly. Uh, you knew him best, I repeated. You were his friend, she went on. His friend, she repeated a little louder. You must have been if he had given you this and sent you for me. I feel I can speak to you, you oh, know. I must speak. I want you, you, you have his last words to know I have been worthy of him. It is not pride. Yes, I am proud to know I understood him better than any on earth. He told, told me so himself. And since his mother died, I have no one, no one to, to. I listened, the darkness deepened. I was not even sure whether he had given me the right bundle. I rather suspect he wanted me to take care of another batch of his papers, which, after his death, I saw the manager examining under the lamp. As the girl talked, easing her pain and the certitude of my sympathy, she talked as thirsty men drink. I had heard that her engagement with Kurtz had been disapproved by her people. 
he wasn't rich or something. Well, indeed, I don't know whether he had been a pauper all his life. He had given me some reason to infer that it was his impatience of comparative poverty that drove him out there. She was saying, he drew men towards him by what was best in them. She looked at me with intensity. It is the gift of the great, she went on. Yes, I know, I said with something like despair in my heart, but bowing my head before the faith that was in her, before the great and saving illusion that shone with an unearthly glow in the darkness, in the triumphant darkness from which I could not have defended her, from which I could not even defend myself. Want a lost me to us. She corrected herself with beautiful generosity, then added in a murmur, To the world. By the last gleams of twilight, I could see the glitter of her eyes, full of tears, of tears that would not fall. I have been very happy. Very fortunate, very proud, she went on. Too fortunate, too happy for a little while. And now I am unhappy for, for life. She stood up. Her fair hair seemed to catch all the remaining light in a glimmer of gold. I rose too. And of all this, of all his promise, and all his greatness, of his generous mind, of his noble heart, nothing remains, nothing but a memory. You and I, we shall always remember him, I said hastily. No, it is impossible that all this should be lost. That such a life should be sacrificed to leave nothing but sorrow. Uh, his words will remain, I said. Men looked up to him. His goodness shone in every act, his example. True, I said. His example too, his example, I forgot that. But I do not, I cannot, I cannot believe, not yet, I can't believe that I'll never see him again, that nobody will ever see him again, never, never, never. She put out her arms as if after a retreating figure stretching them back and with clasped pale hands across the fading and narrow sheen of the window. Never see him. I saw him clearly enough then. I shall see this eloquent phantom as long as I live, and I shall see her too, a tragic and familiar shame resembling in this gesture another one, tragic also, and bedecked with powerless charms, stretching bare brown arms over the glitter of the infernal stream, the stream of darkness. I 
felt like a chill grip on my chest. Forgive me. I, I have mourned so long in silence. In silence. You were with him. You were with him to the last. I think of his loneliness. Nobody near to understand him as I would have understood. Perhaps no one to hear. To the very end, I said shakily. I heard his very last words. I stopped in a fright. Repeat them, she murmured in a heartbroken tone. I want... I want something... Something to live with. I was on the point of crying at her. Don't you hear them? The dusk was repeating them in a persistent whisper all around us, in a whisper that seemed to swell menacingly like the first whisper of a rising wind. The horror! The horror! His last word to live with? Don't you understand? I loved him. I loved him. I loved him. Myself together and spoke slowly. The last word he pronounced was your name. I heard a light sigh and then my heart stood still, stopped dead short by an exulting and terrible cry, by the cry of inconceivable triumph and of, un and of unspeakable pain. She knew. She was sure. I heard her weeping. She had hidden her face in her hands. It seemed to me that the house would collapse before I could escape. That the heavens would fall upon my head. But nothing happened. The heavens did not fall for such a trifle. Would they have fallen, I wonder, if I had rendered Kurtz that justice which was his due? Hadn't he said he wanted only justice? But I couldn't. I could not tell her. It would have been too dark. Too dark altogether. Marlowe ceased and sat apart, indistinct and silent in the pose of a meditating Buddha, but nobody moved for a time. We have lost the first of the ebb, said the director suddenly. I raised my head. The offing was barred by black banks of clouds, and the tranquil waterway leading to the uttermost ends of the earth flowed somber under an overcast sky, seemed to lead into the heart of an immense darkness. you guys enjoyed that tonight don't forget to leave a like comment down below if you're watching the replay any thoughts ideas about this story welcome to the house of thrillers dick marks you're highly welcome ariel ariel williams Deidre, Deidre, good story man, says Jelly Duck, very nice, says Dagan Hills, yeah, I've read it a couple of times, it's different reading it live like this, uh, as you probably heard or can be expected, you get a little tongue-tied with I mean, this was this guy's third language, you guys. He he grew up in a, I would say, a well-to-do family, and I think his father was a poet. But uh, surely he was well-educated, and don't think that he had any idea that when he wrote this, he'd 
it would become one of the most studied works of all time. Yeah, I'm going to be reading the Christmas Carol here next and uh, kind of excited about the holidays. It's going to pull us out of this year's god awful year we've had. Yeah, I appreciate you guys coming out and hearing the last part of The Heart of Darkness. Uh, a little bit, quite a little meaty story there. Well, Dagan, I appreciate that, buddy. He says, I had a crazy English teacher that made me shun the book, but you made it great. Do-da, man. Do-da. Do-da, man. Welcome, buddy. Welcome to the House of Thrillers. I'm Scully, your host and the author that reads to you. I write thrillers at exciting suspense filled thrillers and I read them with sound effects and b-roll that goes along with the story uh, also have some writing tutorials help you learn to write and publish a book the easy way and of course the evolution of the channel has brought on quite a few new ideas uh, one of them certainly been we're gonna be taking dedications uh, you guys reach out, jscullybooks at gmail.com if you'd like to submit a story or something you'd like for me to read. Be more than happy to put that on the list. A lot of, you know, see quite a few people in here I know well and some fantastic channels. Dagan, it's it's not an I guess I don't know. I just get into it and try to make as few mistakes as possible. You know, there's a lot of books and things out there that are being read on YouTube, and this is certainly a different kind of format, somewhat of a director's cut, if you will. But I think it'd be a lot of fun the way we do this. And maybe give you a little break from the norm. Once I can get a library built up, they'll probably have, have a, a playlist that, you know, when you guys are, a lot of my fans like to kick back at the end of the day and pop in some earbuds and fall asleep. Jelly, Jelly Duck. Jelly Duck. What's up, buddy? Duda Man. That's a cool name. Linda Barker says, looking forward to the Christmas Carol. Yeah, I think that's going to be a lot of fun, you guys. It's been a long time since I've seen the movie or read the book or any version of it. And, uh, trying to think how I want to some of the voices that I want to do as far as the ghosts go Deidre what's up Deidre Ariel Williams, welcome to the House of Thrillers. Yeah, I might I might start reading tomorrow, maybe Christmas Carol. Let's see how that goes.
Duda. That's a cool name. thinking of some of the other stuff I have on my list to read. Some of you guys' favorite classic novels. I do on my list. Stuff pile up in here. Jelly Duck, he makes his own music over there. <laughs> you know, what are my thoughts about the Heart of Darkness? I guess I tried to relate myself to Conrad, you know, having written a book and yeah, some Ray Bradbury y'all see that? Dagan Hill said maybe some Ray Bradbury stories library soon and run some streams where I do some unhaulings with my books and try to put some sense into that place. I do put my face on camera at times but uh, I've been working with these overlays they're really a lot of fun and artistic playing around some short form, form content. Any of you guys doing those shorts out there? I'm, I'm sticking to the... Uh, I, I just don't like the vertical format. It's not for me. Yeah, I thought that would be kind of cool, Dagan, to show you some of my books and also give me an opportunity to organize some of that material. But I got a bunch of really rare things and signed copies of books. <clears throat> Cool Husky123, welcome to the House of Thrillers. I'm Scully, the author that reads to you. We just completed The Heart of Darkness, a three-part series. That, uh, if you're interested in some classic literature, you can go back and watch the replays. Welcome to the House of Thrillers. This was a House of Thriller production tonight. Joseph Conrad's The Heart of Darkness.
Dagan says I have a lot of signed books. I made a short with my cat but couldn't seem to post it. to go ahead and end the stream you guys I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out to the house of thrillers next up on the list is a Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens certainly look forward to reading that for the holidays uh, again if you have any suggestions jscullybooks at gmail.com jscullybooks at gmail.com Submit your story and we'll read it live here on House of Thrillers. <laughs> 